So hello, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to this second webinar of the IEEE Signal Processing Society Autonomous System Initiative. Um, just a quick introduction. Uh, so uh, today we're going to have uh, Professor Carl Frinston. Um, just uh, uh, some advertising, say, for uh, the next uh, uh, talk we are going to have in this series. In January, January on 30, we have uh, Professor Cavallaro from Queen Mary University of London. Uh, and uh, on February 28, uh, we're going to have Professor Axel Jans from TU Vien. Um, so I also would like to remind you that we are going to have a, a, a workshop uh, organized in conjunction with the IEEE ICASP uh 2023 that will be in june in rhode island in, in greece uh of course so we are going we are uh currently organizing new uh very interesting hopefully uh talks uh webinars uh for uh the upcoming months uh so the idea is to have one uh talk per per month um so uh let me uh briefly introduce uh professor frinston uh, I think everybody uh, know uh, Professor Frinston. Anyway, uh, you know, he's one of the most influential neuroscientists in uh, in history, let's say. Uh, he was cited up to now over 300,000 times. He's uh, uh, for sure an authority on brain imaging and theoretical neuroscience, especially in the use of uh, physics-inspired statistical methods to model neuroimaging data and other random dynamical systems. He is the key architect of the free energy principle and active inference. Actually, uh, the title of his talk today will be uh, active inference. So I kindly ask you uh, all to uh, keep uh, silent during the presentation that was going to, to last for one, one hour. We're going to have uh, 30 minutes after uh, uh, the presentation for uh, for Q and A, and you are of course encouraged uh, to to put the questions after uh, the presentation. Thank you, uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, the floor is to you. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, it's quite easy to be the most influential neuroscientist in history because neuroscientists were invented about 10 or 20 years ago. So uh, that's slightly cheating, but thank you again for that nice introduction. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak to you. Um, and particularly thank you for attending given it's so close uh, to Christmas. Um, so I should apologize. I'm, I'm not going to really be talking about signal processing. What I'm going to try to do is describe a mechanics for making sense of sequential or ordered data um, of the kind that the brain might use and to try and develop that mechanics from a first principle account of um, sense making and indeed decision making. Uh, and that is, uh, as we have already heard, uh, active inference. Um, I'm gonna call active inference self-evidencing and I'll try and explain what I mean by self-evidencing. Um, I'll overview the different perspectives on self-evidencing in the first slide, but then just um, rehearse the underlying imperatives and objective functions from the point of view of people in artificial intelligence research and machine learning. And then what we'll do is we'll drill down into the mechanics of the belief updating and the self-evidencing using numerical studies simulations and at the end, I will try to take on the challenge of simulating a very simple form of reading um, or sampling data sequentially and trying to make sense of those data. So self-evidencing, what do I mean by that? Well, the idea here, the basic premise is that everything we do, everything that we think and every act that we deploy on the world can be cast as a form of inference. So perception is perceptual inference, and I'm going to talk about action as planning as inference. And the imperative for both perception and action is to optimize beliefs about 
unknown states of the world, say for example, S here, that are generating observations O, and I'm going to denote those beliefs by Q. Similarly, we're going to have random variables, U, control variables, actions, about which we have beliefs that we're going to optimize with respect to a function of those beliefs Q, uh, given um, a certain action or choice or decision. So framing the problem in this way means that I'm going to cast everything as belief updating, optimizing beliefs about S and, Q, uh, and U here, namely the Q here, with respect to a functional, a variational free energy functional of beliefs about states, and an expected free energy functional G of beliefs about what I am doing, my actions. So just to give you an intuition as to the nature of these functional, the variational free energy, for example, um, I've just written down various ways of interpreting this free energy functional. So um, technically, it's um, uh, what's called an, uh, an evidence lower bound or an evidence upper bound in this instance um, that provides a bound or an approximate equality to the log of the probability of some outcomes given me, given uh, some system that's sampling those outcomes. And typically, those outcomes that have a high probability that, of me sampling will be those that characterize um, me as a phenotype, me as an agent, me as an artifact. Um, and in that sense, they are, by definition, those kinds of outcomes that I would typically or characteristically want to um, sample, those preferred outcomes. So they are intrinsically valuable in the sense that the, they are the kind of outcomes that I'd expect to, um, expect to encounter. And it, read in that way, we can now interpret this variational free energy in terms of a value function of outcomes. And from that, we can um, understand the imperatives behind reinforcement learning, optimal control theory and engineering. Uh, and if I was an economist, that would uh, correspond to expected utility theory. Another perspective is afforded by information theory. So the negative of, of this log pro, uh, probability uh, is known as self-information in information theory or surprisal or more simply surprise, namely the implausibility that I would encounter or observe these particular outcomes. And therefore, by optimizing the free energy or this value here, um, I'm implicitly minimizing my surprise. And I can understand that in terms of uh, the Infamax principle, the principle of maximum mutual information, um, alternatively or equivalently, the principles of minimum redundancy, um, and indeed the, uh, the free energy principle. That's nice because the average of the self-information is entropy, which means that this maximization here corresponds to minimizing the entropy of my sensory exchanges with the world or the outcomes that I encounter. And of course, that's the holy grail of um, self-organization in the physics of non-equilibria, um, uh, for example, in synergetics. And if I was a physiologist, it would just be a statement of homeostasis, keeping my outcomes within viable bounds, treating those outcomes as essential variables, basically, and stopping them dissipate um, or um, diverge into regimes that would not be characteristic of me and not be you know, consistent with my physiological survival. There's a final interpretation here, which um, licenses the notion of self-evidencing. Um, instead of this M representing me, it could represent me as a model of how my observations were generated. And on that reading, this quantity here, the probability of some observable data given a model can be understood in terms of Bayesian model evidence, and therefore trying to maximize um, the Bayesian model evidence, I can now understand this imperative here in terms of the Bayesian brain hypothesis. Uh, I can understand it in terms of data assimilation and evidence accumulation um, as evinced in things like predictive coding and compressing sound files, or indeed as an explanation for message passing in the brain. So that's the reason I'm calling it self-evidencing. 
um, action and perception in the service of maximizing the evidence for my models of how those data were generated. Um, we can now regard then perception as belief updating and planning as inference now becomes uh, a description of choosing the right, uh, the most appropriate or self-evidencing uh, ways forward, namely gathering those data which supply evidence for my existence. Um, lots of ways of understanding um, the nature of this free energy function. I've just written it down here in full um, in terms of a negative energy and an entropy term, where crucially the entropy pertains to the entropy of my beliefs about latent states generating data, and the negative uh, energy um, has two terms here, uh, often referred to in terms of the likelihood of certain observations given uh, their latent causes or states and the prior probability of those states before observing the data. And written down like that, you can see that this um, principle of um, optimizing, extremizing the free energy just is James's maximum entropy principle under constraints. Uh, and those constraints are supplied by the negative energy, namely my generative model that can be decomposed into a likelihood and a prior. So this construct is nice. Um, here I've written it down using, um, um, using um, a, 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 an expression which will be more familiar for people in machine learning. So here I've just rearranged the terms and expressed it in terms of a an expected log evidence and a KL divergence between my beliefs about the states generating my observations and the underlying posterior beliefs of those states given some observations. And because this quantity here can never be less than zero, what we have is F is always going to be less than, um, it's going to be um, a lower bound on the log evidence and hence an evidence low bound or an elbow of the sort you'd see um, or use in things like variational autoencoders. The, um, the importance of having a generative model, I think, um, should be emphasized here. Um, because you're optimizing the evidence for a particular model, you always have a generative model, the likelihood and the prior in mind or explicitly articulated. Uh, which means that once you've optimized it, you always have explainable um, artificial intelligence because you know how these data were caused under your generative model. Um, what we will see later is that this also um, provides or prescribes the optimal kind of data that you might want to go and gather or mine in terms of minimizing your uncertainty about the model, namely maximizing the evidence for your model, leading to notions of design optimality in terms of designing the right data mining, moving from big data to smart data, um, leading to notions of smart data foraging, um, epistemics of the kind that might be associated with a, a generalized artificial intelligence. Um, here's another way of writing down this free energy functional, this variation of free energy. Um, and I've written it here in a way that a statistician would understand it. And again, just by rearranging the terms, I can now express it as a mixture of accuracy and complexity, where accuracy is just the goodness of fit. It's the expected log likelihood of some outcomes or observables or data um, expected under my beliefs about how they were caused in terms of these latent states. And then we have this term, this complexity term, which is the divergence between my posterior or approximate posterior beliefs, Q, and my prior beliefs. So this complex term is um, very important. It scores literally the degree to which I change my mind on observing some data. It's the information gain that it actually plays the role of a cost in terms of maximizing the evidence. So what that means is if I'm going to maximize my evidence, I'm going to conform to Occam's principle. I am going to try to find the simplest explanation that retains an accuracy, an accurate but simple explanation, so to get the balance between the accuracy and the complexity right, thereby maximizing the evidence. This is interesting from the point of view of um, 
implementation and um, various ways of framing the cost of a particular exp uh, explanation. So I can read this complexity as a complexity or a computational cost um, leading to notions of bounded rationality and approximate Bayesian inference. It also has implications from the point of view of engineering and the Van Neumann bottleneck and the like, in the sense that um, given Landauer's principle, there, this complexity provides a uh, lower bound on the amount of thermodynamic energy I require to do my belief updating. Um, so to put this very simply, if you're doing it in the best way possible, you're doing it in the quickest and most energy efficient way possible. Another way of um, thinking about the, this um, decomposition into accuracy and complexity is to think about the implications of what you are trying to optimize when it comes to the future consequences of a decision or an action. And this is basically the main message of this presentation, that exactly the same constructs become very useful when thinking about the imperatives for selecting or inferring what plan or policy I'm going to pursue. And basically what we're going to see is that the accuracy that I would expect if I committed to a particular plan becomes um, exactly the same imperative that underlies um, optimal Bayesian design, namely that which maximizes the information gain. In a similar way, the expected complexity becomes something called risk, which is exactly the same quantity that underwrites uh, Bayesian decision theory, where we're reading now loss functions in terms of expected surprise uh, defined in terms of that value um, that we started with. And the two together basically uh, can be regarded as self-evidencing. So. I'm the rest of the talk really is just unpacking this slide, this observation, uh, and illustrating it uh, using numerical studies and um, some neurobiological uh, examples. But to motivate it more uh, intuitively, um, I'm going to ask you to think about this problem. Imagine you're an owl and that you're hungry. And then if I was there in person, I would ask uh, somebody usually on the front row, what are you going to do? And they generally respond quite correctly, well, I'm going to search my food, I'm going to look for my food, and they'd be absolutely right. That would be the first thing that a um, somebody, uh, a predator that was hungry would do. And that answer has within it uh, um, two quite fundamental implications. And I want to illustrate those by deliberately comparing, contrasting two sorts of mechanics or formalisms that you might want to use in order to specify optimal behavior or, or choices. What I will do is actually repair this dialectic like later on and show that one is a special case of the other. But for the moment, I want to draw a bright line between two different kinds of formulations. So the first um, depends upon the notion of a value function of the states of the world that would follow if I acted in this way you subtor at the present time. And if this value function exists, then I can simply choose for any given current state the action that maximizes the value. And I could therefore create a state action policy pi that returns the best thing to do for every given state that I find myself in. However, this kind of approach won't work in terms of searching for your food. And that's almost self-evident because searching for your food is the um, action that you would take to reduce your uncertainty about where your food is located. But uncertainty is an attribute of your beliefs about the world, not the actual state of the world. So that tells you immediately that the optimal action has to be not a function of states of the world, but a functional, a function of a function of beliefs about states of the world. So 
This tells you that optimal action depends upon beliefs about states as opposed to states per se. Also, searching for food tells you something else. It means that the order in which you do things matters. It matters whether I try to eat my food and then search for it, as opposed to trying to search for it and then trying to eat it. Um, which means that there's a different kind of construction here for the optimal policy. It's a sequential policy, which means that I now have to consider the function, not just of any belief about the current state, but all states into the future under a given sequence of actions, U, uh, T, T plus one, et cetera, uh, which I'm denoting by pi here. And um, I've written it down like that, um, so that I can now refer to this G, which is going to be an expected free energy as an energy functional, which means that the sum or the path integral over time is now going to be an action as would be called um, by a physicist, a path integral or a time integral um, of energy here, namely action. So this kind of construction in which we also now have to optimize our beliefs about um, the consequences of our actions by maximizing the free energy um, can be best described and most simply described in this instance as a principle of stationary action and in, the, and in this case, um, um, maximizing um, this uh, evidence lower bound and its expected version, the expected free energy G here. So I introduced that just to contrast it with the Bellman optimality principle that would attend this kind of construct here. And I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with lots of instances of um, uh, schemes that operate under the Bellman optimality principle, optimal control theory, dynamic programming, deep RL, Bayesian decision theory, and so on. And then the equivalent schemes under this principle of stationary action would be well, the free energy principle itself and active inference. Um, and what we will see is um, notions of artificial curiosity and in the, um, robotics, for example, intrinsic motivation um, that speak to uh, resolving uncertainty, the epistemics that um, underlie optimal Bayesian design and crucially sequential policy optimization. We're talking about paths and trajectories here as opposed to um, states that ensue um, um, point time by time. Uh, moving from Markov decision processes, for example, to partially observed uh, Markov decision processes where beliefs about unobservable or latent states uh, start to figure much more centrally in the maths. So um, just to um, rehearse now the functional forms of these uh, variational free energies and expected free energies, I've just written them out again here. Um, if you don't like or remember all the maths, then please don't worry about the equations here. I'm using them almost iconically just to illustrate what I think is a, a very beautiful symmetry um, between the variational free energy, which we're trying to optimize in relation to our beliefs about states generating data, and the expected free energy G that is a functional of both of those beliefs and the policies that I would entertain in terms of how I'm going to move forward into the future. So here's a, again is the free energy written in terms of a mixture of accuracy and complexity that can be rearranged very simply to demonstrate that it is an evidence lower bound given this KR divergence can be never be less than zero. And here are here is the equivalent expression for the expected free energy and it's called expected simply because we're taking an expectation under the predicted outcomes that I would encounter if I pursued this policy. Um, so we're conditioning now upon a policy, but the functional form remains very similar, where we can see that the complexity uh, becomes risk, the inaccuracy becomes ambiguity, and the divergence and evidence become expected information gain and cost um, or negative cost uh, respectively. So let me just unpack that very briefly related to things which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, let's just look at the components of the expected free energy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take various sources of uncertainty off the table and see if I can get back to the Bellman optimality like um, um, formulation of optimal behavior. But let's ignore in the first instance 
the expected um, the expected value, or uh, if I multiply by minus one, the um, the surprisal or the expected cost. Uh, so I I prefer everything. Uh, I have no particular preferences. So all I'm left with now is this quantity here. So what is this quantity? Well, it's just the KL divergence between beliefs about states of the world, given some observations that I would get in the future if I pursued some policy, relative to those beliefs without those observations. So this is just the expected information gain. It's just the degree to which I have resolved my uncertainty by getting those data if I pursued this policy. And in the neurosciences, in particular, the visual search literature, this is known as um, expected Bayesian surprise. And for those of you in uh, information theory, you recognize this immediately uh, as simply the mutual information between causes and consequences, the, the uh, latent causes of observable consequences uh, conditioned upon a particular policy. So let me now take one kind of uh, uncertainty um, out of the game, and let's ignore the ambiguity. What does that mean? Well, it just means that there is no uncertainty about the states of the world given some observations and vice versa, uh, which means I can replace all the S's with O's and the risk term now reduces to either the KL divergence between Q beliefs about states or future observations, which are now random variables because they haven't occurred yet, and my prior beliefs. So what does that mean? Well, it, it just means that the risk is the divergence between what I anticipate will happen and what a priori I prefer to happen. So it scores the, the divergence between what I think is going to happen and what I prefer uh, to happen. Um, and then in, and, uh, in engineering, this is known as KL control. Um, in economics, it could also be read as a form of risk-sensitive control um, in the sense that there is no ambiguity. Finally, let me remove all um, reducible uncertainty um, and um, um, assume that there is no more information to be gained. I know everything I, um, I, uh, that I can know about the consequences of my action and the hidden or latent states of the world. But I'm just left with the, um, the expected cost or the negative expected value or utility. And of course, this takes us right back to the Bellman optimality principle and expected utility theory, where because there isn't any uncertainty, I don't have to worry about beliefs, and I can now deploy uh, standard um, reinforcement learning or Q learning or any, any other scheme that rests upon the Bellman optimality principle. So in summary, what we're saying is that um, this expected free energy, this expected um, bound on um, the evidence for my models of how the world works, of, of the sensed world, can be decomposed into expected value and expected information gain, um, where Expected value is just the objective function that underwrites uh, Bayesian decision theory and leads to uh, optimal Bayesian decisions under uncertainty given some prior preferences or cost functions. In addition, I'm going to do this whilst exploring in the sense of maximizing my expected information gain. And this is the, um, the Bayes optimal experimental design imperative, basically. Um, if I had to choose certain data points, what data points would I choose to be most informative and resolve the most uncertainty about my hypotheses or my model of how those data were generated? Uh, exactly the same kind of objective function that you'd see in active learning. And together, we have essentially um, base optimal decision theory and base optimal design uh, constituting active inference and learning. Um, so I'm going to spend the remaining uh, part of the presentation just you know, providing you with a couple of worked examples um, and deal with um, one of the more interesting kinds of generative models for which we can, under which we can self-evidence, namely deep, uh, temporally deep uh, generative models. Um, but before I go there, let me just um, rehearse the, the um, 
the, the foundations of the kind of modeling that we use to try and understand the message passing and the, um, the implementation of this kind of self-evidencing. Um, generally, what we do is work with Markov decision processes, um, which we can write down in a very simple way in terms of a probabilistic graphical model. So for example, here, again, please ignore the equations. Everything that we need to know is in graphical form here. Um, what we're assuming is that any given world um, um, is um, so, or a world generates outcomes or observables from latent states via likelihood mapping, usually denoted by A. And the dynamics in this world are um, parameterized or modeled in this probabilistic graphical model by transition tensors or matrices that shift every time step the state of the world into the next state, where crucially, these transitions depend upon action, namely the policy, where the policy itself depends upon the expected free energy uh, that we have just rehearsed. Um, and the nice thing about um, this um, depiction of the structure of a generative model in this graphical form is that if there exists this graphical model, there, was, there is always, if you like, a conjugate or a, um, an equivalent graphical model that um, called a factor graph, in this instance, a, a normal style or Forney style factor graph. And these are really useful. Um, and basically what you do is you, you sort of switch the edges to the, the nodes and vice versa. So now the nodes become factors and the edges now um, correspond to beliefs or the sufficient statistics of various probability distributions that you pass amongst the nodes in order to do the belief updating that maximizes the evidence lower bound um, as I've written it uh, down here. So this is, if you like, standard um, off the shelf belief propagation or variational message passing um, that um, any particular generative model would uh, demand simply because for every given generative model, there is a factor graph and for every factor graph, you can now uh, just go and get some off the shelf um, um, variational message passing that you know will maximize the evidence lower bound or the variational free energy. And I've just written down uh, the functional form of these uh, things here um, to describe some of the messages. So let's, for example, just take um, beliefs about um, the, um, the latent state at this point in time. And what we can see is that they receive messages from the observables, the sensory evidence at hand, and messages from the future and messages from the past that put constraints on the most likely state that is sandwiched between them. And that these messages are contextualized by the policy that I'm uh, currently pursuing. Um, and the, the functional forms here bear a remarkable similarity um, to the functional forms of equations that we use in computational neuroscience when we try and simulate this kind of belief propagation and updating and indeed learning um, in, the, uh, in the human brain. Um, so we can, um, I've just rewritten these uh, variational updates here that um, ensue from the message passing um, on the left-hand side um, and written down the corresponding uh, message passing graph that we think might operate in a very simple picture of a brain. And the interesting thing is, I repeat, that, that these update equations are very, very simple and also very similar to what we'd use in neuroscience. So for example, we have to only update, update our beliefs about things we don't know. We only don't know the latent states and the policies. And I've actually included here um, uh, a softmax or a precision parameter uh, reflecting the confidence in my beliefs about um, the what I'm going to do next um, um, gamma or the inverse of gamma, which is beta here, uh, we refer to as precision. But if we just focus on perception and policy selection, then perception just is updating expected expectations about states of the world. That is a, a nonlinear function, say a voltage current function of linear mixtures of um, observations, representations, expectations about the past and the and the future that are mixed through with these um, tensors, likelihood and prior tensors here that have a very simple parameterization to produce when uh, when applying the softmax operator um, the, the 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 
optimal belief, the uh, elbow or evidence maximizing belief about hidden states of the world. The policy selection just reduces to a classical softmax response rule predicated on the expected free energy. Uh, learning uh, reduces to um, a canonical kind of associative plasticity with associative terms, decay terms here, here illustrated for D, which uh, parameterizes the initial latent states. And action selection, as we have just discussed, um, simply follows from the policy selection, namely selecting the next um, action or control variable from the most likely policy. And with that, we can simulate all kinds of behavior. I'll give you one brief example just to illustrate um, the, the most uh, notable um, cardinal feature of the kind of behavior that ensues from this self-evidencing or active inference. Um, so here, imagine that um, there's a little mouse and it is in a tea maze and can make two moves. Um, and the mouse wants to find a reward or a preferred outcome um, denoted here by the red ball that can either be on the left or the right of the upper arm. Um, and because the rat, or sorry, the mouse does not know where, uh, whether the reward is going to be on the left or the right hand side, um, and can only make two moves. And furthermore, once the mouse commits to a particular arm, it has to stay there. It can take a gamble and go to the left. And if it's right, it will spend two moves with the reward. If it's wrong, it'll spend no moves with the reward. So on average, it will be right 50% uh, of the time. However, here to make things interesting and um, emphasize the special role of beliefs and belief updating, We've introduced a third kind of outcome or cue in the bottom arm of the tea maze, where the color of this instructional cue tells the mouse where the reward is. So now the mouse has got a choice. It can use its first move to go and look at the cue in the bottom of the maze and then move directly to where it knows the reward is, spending one move with the reward on every trial. So still, from the point of view of the expected reward, it's still 50% of the time with the reward. But of course, it's now much more confident about what's, what, it's going to, what is going to happen and what it is going to do because it's responding to this expected information game, this epistemic affordance um, that is part of this expected free energy. Um, and that's basically what I want to show you. Um, the, the, these graphics and uh, matrices are, uh, just meant to illustrate how simple it is to write down these generative models in terms of transitions amongst various states and the different policies uh, and the outcomes in terms of whether there is a reward at the different locations or not. The prior preferences here just written down in terms of log probabilities or log odds ratios um, specifying that the reward, that the preferences here are just to be with um, the reward um, and everything else is equally preferred. So what kind of behavior do we get when we integrate that message passing scheme, that belief updating scheme um, in under that generative model? Well, here what I've done is just illustrated the outcomes of some simulated trials, 32 trials, where the colors of these circles here denote whether the reward was on the left or the right hand side. The, um, it, the image here and the, uh, the sort of gray bars here um, describe the probability distribution over various policies. So the policies are only two moves that can go down and uh, to the left or down and to the right, or it could stay and go to the right, or it could uh, go to, uh, down and then go back to the middle again. Um, so a finite number of sequences of actions, which the mouse is trying to evaluate in terms of the expected free energy and then um, forming posterior beliefs that enable it to plan via inference about what it is likely to do next and then select the most likely behavior. Um, these show the outcomes in terms of the expected um, um, reward or expected prior preference here um, and reaction times. And this is just um, the scoring the learning of the initial states, the context was the reward on the right or the left. And indeed, as one might expect, when the mouse first starts, 
um, the trial, um, it will always go and um, respond to this epistemic affordance, engage in this epistemic foraging before becoming exploitative and going to secure its reward. But in this instance, we've played a trick on the mouse. What we've done after the first few trials, we've left the reward on the left-hand side. And that has an interesting implication because as time goes on, the mouse learns that the reward is always on the left hand side, which means that there's less and less information gain afforded by going down to an instructional queue. So the explorative policy becomes less and less attractive as the expected information gain starts to fall below the expected value of going straight to the reward, which it is now, or the mouse is now fairly confident it knows where the reward is. And indeed, after trial 20, there's this um, switching behavior from exploration to exploitation, simply because the mouse has now become familiar with its environment and there is no more reducible uncertainty. And therefore, the epistemic affordance has given way to the um, the expected utility or the pragmatic affordance of going and sitting with its reward for two moves directly. And this is a very generic behavior. It, it dissolves the exploration exploitation dilemma uh, simply by putting the, the two imperatives of exploration exploitation together in the same functional that um, 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 underwrites the, the self-evidencing um, uh, and inherits from the functional form of this bound on model evidence. Um, I won't go into this in any detail. If I was speaking to a neuroscience uh, audience, there are all sorts of interesting things one can do now. Because we've actually got a, an in silico, a synthetic mouse who's updating her beliefs and learning, we can now go and perform simulated uh, neuroscience experiments. We can uh, look at the belief updating and uh, through the lens of neuronal activity and look at firing rates um, um, associated with the chosen and unchosen option as is done in um, neurobiology and electrophysiology. We can think of the representations as um, fulfilling the role of a working memory of a prospective or retrospective sort that changes as time marches on. Um, we can even go and record the activity of various representations of locations and simulate place fields, place cell-like activity, and do all sorts of things, including things like the mismatch negativity paradigm. I, mean, I want to close now by um, taking you to a slightly more interesting kind of generative model and illustrating the sorts of behaviors that one can simulate and also uh, briefly look at the um, uh, corresponding neuronal correlates of this belief updating, this self-evidencing under deep generative models. Um, so what do I mean by deep generative models? Well, let's uh, go back to that um, um, dual aspect rendering of a generative model in terms of a graphical model, in terms of a Markov decision process, and its corresponding or conjugate factor graph describing the requisite message passing. What I'm going to do now is take this um, um, Markov decision process um, and replicate it, but place another one on top that crucially unfolds more slowly in time. So the depth of these um, um, hierarchically composed Markov decision processes in this deep model is accompanied by a separation of time scales so that the transitions at the higher level provide a context for the faster transitions at the lower level, basically um, destroying any simple Markovian property and rendering now the generative model um, effectively semi-Markovian or non-Markovian by virtue of the separation of time scales. Um, and the way that this, in this example, uh, this is done is usually um, by identifying some state of the world that uh, endures um, for the 
unfolding of the faster states at the lower level. And of course, one obvious candidate is the initial state. So the initial state is always the same. The first state is always the same um, um, during the unfolding of states or the state transitions or the path of the trajectory during this epoch. So effectively, the higher level is providing the initial uh, conditions for the lower level. Um, when viewed from the point of view of the practograph, um, this nicely illustrates the um, bottom-up and top-down message passing that inherits from the, this deep architecture. So from the point of view of the lower level, the top-down level is actually providing empirical prior constraints that afford a context sensitivity to this little time epoch of exchange with the world. And this context will change in the next epoch in a lawful way as modeled by the, uh, the higher level um, message passing here. From the point of view of the higher level, the lower level is actually providing evidence that you are in this particular context as opposed to that particular context. So there's a mutual reciprocal exchange of sufficient statistics or beliefs that enable this um, non-Markovian generative model of non-Markovian outcomes um, that has this inherent time and context sensitivity. Um, so to close, I just want to illustrate what that looks like in practice when you deploy these models, both to generate sequences of observables and then um, try to recognize the underlying causes of those um, observations. So what I'm going to do is um, present very briefly a deep model of reading, a simple model of reading um, in the sense that we're not talking about letters, we're just talking about sort of an iconographic script um, where each word is composed of different letters and different um, arrangements in, uh, um, on four points uh, on a two by two grid here. So for example, if there's a bird icon next to a cat icon, the implicit word is flea. And if the bird is next to some seeds, the implicit word, uh, the semantic, if you like, um, is feed. And if there's nothing there, we just wait. Um, and this would be um, um, a suitable kind of um, labeling of latent states that would be required to generate observed outcomes through simply sampling the letters of a word. So what are those outcomes? Well, I just need to specify what, what the agent could see if it foveated one of these letters here, and it would uh, see uh, either nothing, some seeds, a bird, or a cat, and these are the discrete outcomes. Um, another outcome is where am I looking, um, a proprioceptive outcome. And if I knew exactly which word I was looking at and where I was looking, so I was looking at one, and the word was feed, then I would see a bird and I would feel myself looking at location one. So this would be uh, fit for purpose um, um, for a very simple generative model of epistemic foraging or ex, um, epistemic expiration, just scanning the letters of a, uh, of a word. But now I want to equip it with a deeper um, architecture that would be more apt to model reading. Um, and what would I need to do to do that? Well, I would need to be able to generate the word that the agent is currently um, um, sampling, which means my hidden states would now have to become a sequence of words, namely a sentence. Um, so I'd need to know what the sentence was, and I'd need to know where in the sentence I was currently looking, uh, at which word I was currently looking. So, for example, if I knew that the sentence was flee, wait, feed, and wait, and I knew that I was looking at the second word, then that would be wait. If I, um, um, and therefore I now know what word I'm looking at. And if I know where I was looking, I can now tell you exactly what I would see. So, this would be an appropriate generative model for a very simple kind of reading where the whole universe um, uh, just contains these uh, six sentences here. Um, and now the idea is, can we simulate evidence accumulation over separable, separable timescales um, that enables an agent to infer not just what word they are currently reading, but also the context name of the sentence that that word came, came for and do that in real time using 
this belief um, update scheme or variational message passing scheme uh, under this kind of deep generative model. And indeed, one can, and these are the kind of results that um, ensue. And so at the top here, what I've shown are the four words of the sentence that the, the uh, um, simulated subject was uh, uh, reading. Um, and the red dots correspond to her actions, her saccadic eye movements, where she looked in the sentence to gather the right kind of information with the most um, expected information gain that would resolve her uncertainty about what she was currently seeing in terms of the first level words, second level uh, sentences. Um, and what we see um, here is something which is very characteristic of the way that you and I read. Namely, we jump very quickly to the most informative letters and um, icons that provide disambiguating information. So for example, um, the very first saccade, she sees a cat. And therefore she knows that the first word must be flea because to see a cat means that, there has, that, that the only word with a cat in it is flea. So she's resolved, there is no more resolvable uncertainty about remaining and sampling the remaining letters of this word. And so she jumps to the next word, uh, which is um, possibly a weight and confirms that by sampling by chance to null outcomes, jumps to the next one. It's a bird that's a bit ambiguous. It could be a flea or feed. She confirms it's a feed by going to the second letter in that word. And as soon as she's resolved that uncertainty, jumps to the end um, and um, discovers that that is a, another weight uh, word. And here are the sort of um, the posterior beliefs that are being updated during time, during these satanic eye movements um, at the first level in terms of what are the letters that are subtending um, beliefs or belief updating about the sentence, which is shown, beliefs about the sentence are shown here um, in the, uh, the second level in the upper row. Uh, and what one can see from this is that only at the end um, is there going to be um, a resolution of uncertainty about uh, which sentence she was reading simply because it's just the last word that resolves that uncertainty. Another way of showing those data, of the synthetic data, um, um, is in terms of looking at the posterior expectations or beliefs about different states, namely in this instance, at the higher level, which sen sentence um, am I looking at? And which word am I looking at as a function of successive eye movements? Um, and one can see immediately that the belief updating at the lower level is much, uh, is much quicker. Um, so for the first uh, saccade or two, um, I confirm uh, that um, I'm looking at the letter flea and then move to the next letter uh, and then it's, uh, um, its weight um, uh, or I accumulate my beliefs uh, um, to believe that it is weight, uh, and then move to the next um, uh, the next word here. In contrast, the belief updating about the word is much slower. Um, and indeed, because um, only these two sentences begin with flea, um, immediately this subject, or if I was doing this, I would believe that it has to be either uh, sentence one or four, but I can't resolve that uncertainty until the end because the only disambiguating word is uh, at the last point, the word weight versus flea. And as soon as I see that, then I can resolve my uncertainty about which word I am looking at while I've inferred that it is weight at the lower level. These are the same data shown here, but what I've done here is just filter them using the same filters that we use in EEG or neurophysiology, electrophysiology research um, in um, neuroscience just to illustrate the similarity between um, these, these patterns of synthetic neuronal representation, say neural firing, or um, um, changes in neural firing as reflected in local field potentials and um, electrographic, uh, cortographic signals. Um, and I'm just showing a couple of examples in closing um, that speak to this kind of pattern of neuronal responses that we presume um, is reflecting the same kind of belief updating and message passing 
uh, in the simulation. So, for example, here, if we treat these as raster plots of neural firing, they look very similar to empirical pre saccadic delay period activity in the prefrontal cortex, while um, these fluctuations in the filtered time series look very sim uh, sim uh, similar to perisaccadic field potentials during active vision, uh, showing these characteristic fast responses at the lower level here in visual error number two, and these slower responses of, uh, reflecting this belief updating at a higher level here, the uh, area TE in, uh, in a monkey. So again, this is not terribly interesting from the point of view of signal processing, but it is interesting that the same dynamics on these structured graphs uh, suggested by this off-the-shelf kind of um, belief propagation or, or message passing um, looks or, or um, produces patterns of activity of the kind that we can actually see in the, um, in the functioning brain. So I will summarize everything that I've just said um, in um, a much more concise way by borrowing from the, uh, the words of uh, Helmholtz. Each movement we make by which we alter the appearance of objects should be thought of as an experiment designed to test whether we have understood correctly the invariant relations of the phenomena before us. That is their existence in definite spatial relations. And with that, it only remains for me to thank um, those people whose ideas I've been talking about. And of course, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Carla. Very interesting talk, very inspiring talk. Inspiring talk. Thank, thank you so much. So we have, of course, time for questions. So uh please feel free to open your microphone put questions raise your hand if you prefer or write in the chat i have a question hello hi carl yes, please Jonathan Dowles here i have a question uh, carl are you able to uh integrate your framework oh, hello. hello can you hear me uh, conscious yeah. perception versus <clears throat> unconscious perception so can you model uh, consciousness in that uh, framework um, that's a great question. <laughs> I think um, if you can, if, if it depends what you what what sort of um, level of consciousness you'd be happy with. Um, you know, no certainly level, uh, whether you you perceive something consciously, so you can see something but you don't perceive it, versus you see it and you perceive it as well. Like there might be something in in, in your visual scene you don't actually yeah. re realize it. It's there. Yeah, right. I th uh, yeah, I think there are probably two levels. I mean, certainly from the point of view of um, Herman Helmholtz and the notion of unconscious inference as visual perception, um, then certainly this is exactly stealing and implementing those uh, you know those ideas in modern day um, belief up or message passing schemes. Um, so I'd certainly say that you know unconscious perceptual inference um, is exactly what's going on here. You could argue that the posterior, um, the, the posterior belief would be the content of a percept. And, it, and that sort of very simple-minded um, sort of mapping between the, the mathematical quantities, the Bayesian beliefs are of a mathematical sort to a perceptual belief, then yes, you could argue that there is a kind of consciousness. But I, I think what you're talking about is the qualitative experience of the percept that I know that I am seeing red, or I know that this word is, I think that's a lot more subtle. Um, there are people who think you can model it in this, um, in this kind of framework, um, but it, uh, uh, only under very special conditions. And those special conditions mean you have to have a kind of mental action that involves updating the precision of the, um, of the beliefs that have um, that render the the form of the message uh, passing um, um, uh, dependent upon your internal action state. So, um, if this was a predictive coding scheme, um, then that would correspond to the Kalman gain, for example. So, if you now get control over the Kalman gain, then that that control can be read as a kind of internal action. Um, and at that point, then you become an agent of your perception. It may be that that's the closest you can start to get to um, 
having a phenomenal qualitative experience. You have to have a change, an active change in the calm and gain or the precision or the attention that you're affording these particular messages as opposed to those particular messages. Right. So you, know, you, you start doubting your perception, like you, you don't believe what you're seeing and then uh, maybe you doubt yourself what's happening. I, I don't believe what I'm seeing. Uh, yeah, maybe that's the issue then, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. And of course, yeah. And then, of course, that would change your attention if you thought, did I see this or didn't I see that? And then you would focus. And again, that's speaking to this mental action that you have to have this sort of uh, explicit attentional aspect. So a vanilla Kalman filter, I, I don't think would have that. But, you know, you could engineer and people have tried doing this. You could actually engineer this sort of, a, you know, uh, dynamic um, estimation of the precision of the of, of 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 these mappings, and I think you could be getting closer to conscious perception. It wouldn't be self-conscious, but it it would it may have it, it may have the mechanisms that would be sufficient for uh, that phenomenal consciousness. Yeah, well, I guess um, un unconscious perception doesn't change your actions, or it's not so clear. Um, no, I think it can. I, th I think reflexes, certainly homeostatic yeah. reflexes, would be modeled like that. Yeah, you'd, uh, and in fact, interestingly, you, you, you're often not aware of those reflexes uh, simply because the, the, they are subject to uh, psychological or physiologically something called um, sensory attenuation, um, which physiologically just means you ignore those signals by reducing the synaptic efficacy mathematically it would be in a predictive coding formulation of the message passing or a Bayesian filter. It would be like um, switching the Kalman gain to zero temporarily. Um, and then what happens is that the, the, the prediction errors are forced back out to engage reflexes, autonomic reflexes on the muscle. So I would imagine that quite a lot of um, active inference, um, certainly in the interceptive domain, actually is completely subpersonal and completely automatic. And it's just those things that um, we can't explain that suddenly require us to attend to and to think about and that we would actually perceive. That's, uh, yeah, okay. a good, good, good Thank point, you. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, I have a question. Can I ask? Yes, please, please. Okay. Uh, for, first, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Uh, when you were talking about the decision of mouse, you shortly mentioned about gambling. So is there any theoretical connection between gambling theory, in particular Kelly criterion, and this active inference? That's a, a very, I have never been asked that question before. Um, certainly um, active inference or, or the formalism uh, that I just described under these um, Markov decision processes has been used to um, address the multi-armed bandit problem as you know, a, a canonical uh, decision theoretic problem um, in a Bayes way, a Bayes optimal fashion. Um, so gambling and choice behavior under uncertainty is exactly what this kind of scheme is meant to deal with. Because, you know, because I repeat, once you put uncertainty quantification into the game, you have to deal with belief updating and the mechanics of uh, um, sort of um, passing messages about belief, hence the, the, you know, the, the, the factor graph and the variational message passing. Um, so in a sense, active inference is all about gambling. However, if you meant gambling from the point of view of a pathological behavior and the prior beliefs that people who uh, become addictive, for example, um, get engaged with, then um, I think that's a slightly more um, searching question um, and uh, usually, and, and it, indeed, it's the kind of question that my colleagues, uh, indeed me, um, um, my colleagues in, in psychiatry and psychology become very exercised by. Um, one interesting um, aspect of uh, applying active inference to um, abnormal behavior and psychopathology read as false inference or um, um, odd kinds of inferences um, is something called the complete class theorem, um, which really comes from sort of um, statistics. Um, and what that says is for any pair of behaviors and loss functions, there are always some prior beliefs that render you Bayes optimal. So what that means is um, you can always describe any given behavior under any given loss function in terms of one of these active inference schemes. Um, but that um, that that um, explanation 
may, um, requires you to actually identify the priors that make this behavior Bayes optimal, which basically means that you can, you know there exists some prior beliefs that describe uniquely this person's behavior. So sometimes people um, are interested in um, fitting these active inference choice um, 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 behavior models to individuals' behavior, and then trying to adjust the priors in the model in order to match the behavior of the synthetic model, the digital twin, if you like, to the real person, and then and try and understand what this person's prior beliefs were that caused them to gamble in this kind of way. And it's a really interesting uh, field because you know there's anecdotal evidence from psychophysics and psychology that people say with schizophrenia jump to conclusions um, that would suggest that they have um, imprecise prior beliefs or that they, they may be um, unable to wait until more definitive evidence arises or they may be um, certain conditions associated um, with an inability to um, decrease uh, the precision of sensory input and that would um, their prior beliefs means that they would be always um, attending to sensory input and that's been used as a um, an explanation for um, certain conditions like autism and the like so that you know you can you can use this machinery to try and emulate certain kinds of behavior such as gambling behavior um, in, uh, and to do that um, in a quantitative and formal way by explaining somebody's choice behavior in terms of their prior beliefs at a particular point point in the model. Um, so I'm not quite sure which, which which sort of gambling you were talking about, but does that answer your question roughly? Yeah, so my question was uh, more the technical part that uh, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, it is actually the same. So the active inference has uh, the same concept of the... So Kelly Criterion actually makes the best decision based on some beliefs in the gambling theory. Uh, yes. As you mentioned, so it's the same. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a gentleman called uh, Dmitry Markovich, um, I think in two, um, where is he now? You look at um, Dresden, Dresden, I think he's in Dresden, um, who spent a lot of time looking at sort of um, various UTC and Thompson sampling in the context of multi-armed bandit and gambling problems and trying to cast that in a more, uh, in the most general way, where usually um, these active inference models are the most general way um, of framing the problem. Of course, there are, um, lots of interesting issues about deep researches in the panning side, which usually discriminate one scheme from another scheme, but certainly the mechanics of it um, will be formally identical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I have a question. Please. Uh, thank you, uh, Carl, for a comprehensive uh, synthesis of uh, active inference from the fundamental basis. However, uh, my question is tailored towards um, active inference for continuous um, state space, most especially where the state space is random in nature, in, in, in nature which demands random actions, probably. Now, we learn an optimal prior. So the optimal prior include evidence from the past and evidence from the, from the future or evidence of the uncertainties that we don't know. How do we learn a model of the uncertainties that we do, we do not know, especially in random environments that at each instance in time, what you learn as optimal prior during action selection might be different if the agent is faced with, with, with a surprise that was not captured in the optimal prior. How does your action selection validate the uncertainties that was not captured in the uh, preferred observation? 
Right, that, that, that was an excellent question. And I think actually that question pertains to both continuous state space and discrete state space models. Uh, you know, I think what you're talking about here, you know, if you were a, an economist, it'd be sort of radical uncertainty um, as the, you know, as the sort of the ultimate unknown unknowns, yes. or probably more simply as volatility, um, where, where you, could, you could imagine volatility being a, a, a known unknown or an unknown known. Um, uh, and both, I think, speak to, um, you know, how do you put that sort of context sensitivity into generative models where the, you know, where it is the uncertainty that, that is the, um, the key to resolving what is the optimal thing to do. Um, so the, uh, it's a great question. And the, the solution to the problems that you bring to the table um, I think are important to identify both in point, from the point of view of neuroscience, but also I would imagine um, in rendering any artificial intelligence or signal processing system uh, sufficiently context sensitive. So the, the way I look at this is um, the uh, first of all, separating the inference and learning problem into three levels and then identifying um, where the important uncertainty lies. So the first level um, of, um, if you like, unknowns uh, corresponds to the states um, that you could encounter. And that would, um, you know, recognizing those states and belief updating to arrive at the best probabilistic uh, description of those states would be inference. And then you have the parameters of, of the generative model um, that are learned over longer periods of time and then finally, you're going to have the very structure of the model, the structure of the graph itself, um, irrespective of the particular parameterization of, say, the connections or the, um, or the probabilistic mappings. And that would be known as structure learning. And at each level, you can have uncertainty that has to be um, modeled in your generative model or has to be part of your, of your in inversion scheme. Um, and if it's not, you can run into trouble and, and running into trouble is exactly, you know, the, the, I think what, what your question speaks to, you know, how do you cope with this? Well, to cope with it, you have to be able to model um, the possibility that you have not encountered this structure or this, uh, that your, your model, um, that your, well, let's take it step by step. First of all, um, at the level of parametric learning, say the, so at the level of state estimation, um, what happens if some random, um, if some random effect or stochastic aspect, or indeed a, you know, um, a non-stochastic aspect of your environment changes? Yes. Um, then, in order to detect that, basically, you're talking about uh, how do you cope with volatility um, yes. in the in the states? In order to cope with that, you have to have a model of that. Um, and um, what generally happens in my world is, is that you, you, know, you immediately have to have a high, an extra level that models slow contextual changes, um, both in terms of the, you know, the, the sort of um, the expected outcomes, but also implicit in a probabilistic model, the, the, the volatility or the uncertainty in the state transitions. Um, I've seen you know, perhaps a, a clear example of that would be um, something called a hierarchical Gaussian filter um, developed by a colleague of mine, um, Chris Mathis, in, um, who started in Zurich, but now is in, is in, in Denmark. Um, okay. and, and, and what he does, he, re, he just focuses on the uncertainty. Um, so it's a, it's a deep model and it's a Gaussian process-like model okay. and it's got layer upon layer upon layer. But the only thing that the higher layers provide constraints on um, at the lower level is exactly the variance of the random fluctuations. So it's effectively a volatility model. It sort of recognizes when you're in a very predictable uh, context, yeah. but then the variance or the inverse bias, the precision of various um, transitions or effects will itself change in his model, usually using an autoregression model, so the, a random jump. So he, you have to actually you know, like equip your model with this okay. deep temporal structure in order to estimate the volatility. Uh, and that sort of ideology, I think, carries through both to the, um, the parametric learning and also the very structure of the model itself. Um, now, I've never gone this far in terms of um, artificial intelligence or 
uh, computational neuroscience, but in my um, um, life as a, um, a a data analyst, okay. we quite often um, have, you know, have this problem that we've got so, you know, some data, we have a, a generative model, a state-space model of this sort of complex system. We've inverted the model. We don't quite know its form. So we have sort of you know, 10 or 100 of these different models with different configurations. So now we have a probability distribution, the posterior over model space itself. And that can be very useful when it comes to things like Bayesian models, averaging, or just evaluating the um, the plausibility of this kind of structure versus that kind of structure. But again, the point I think you're driving at, you actually have to have this hierarchical level and this space of a, 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 the, to, to be able to quantify the uncertainty at that level to get this sort of um, um, to get this context and time sensitivity. If you don't do that, you'll never know, and you'll just be committed to the wrong model because you haven't okay, explored okay, other, okay, other okay. models. Okay. Is that what you were? You were? You were? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So we need to learn um, optimal Harakaka models in our yeah. prior beliefs. Then yeah, we select um, actions to our preferred model. Now, in the action selection, do we we cannot select multiple actions, so we take the uh, the mean or the, the variance of the actions towards the preferred uh, model. That's another excellent question. It's, uh, yes, uh, uh, um, so here is another instance of um, um, stochasticity in this. So um, you you have a choice in active in active inference, both in continuous uh, state spaces. Um, and discrete state spaces, but much better explored in the discrete state space. So um, you're, you're absolutely right. So you're planning as inference. The objective of that is, is basically to infer a, a probability distribution over a, a, a set of plausible policies, yes. and they're plausible by having a non a non-zero posterior. Yes. Um, and then the question is, well, which one do you do? Which one do you select? Yes. Um, you know, uh, there's no rule here. Uh, you know, if you're um, if you are a physicist, um, that distribution actually is the distribution over the paths a system would take. So, you know, um, if you wanted to simulate a system, you'd actually sample a, a policy from that distribution. And it would okay. be a bit like sort of matching theorem, isn't it? That, you know, you know uh, agents choose uh, or select randomly policies in proportion to their plausibility. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, but what we actually do is, is as you say, take, take, the, take the most likely policy. Yeah, the mean, yeah. Stimulation. Okay, okay, um, okay. Um, uh, and the reason we do that is that very often, um, when you're actually explaining individual behavior, um, you have to put that randomness back in because people do actually have a matching like um, stochastic sampling from plausible policies. Um, so, um, but when you want to simulate the average behavior of this kind of subject over an infinite number of trials, then you can use the most likely policy. So most of our simulations just take the most likely policy okay, okay. Uh, to specify the next action. But when you use the, the, this, the, the, this, this kind of simulation model to fit observed behavior, then you actually um, sample your action from the probability distribution um, uh, over all the, uh, all the plausible, plausible policies. Um, so it's a, it, is a, it is a vexed and interesting question. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, your synthesis here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, very good. Other questions in the audience? We'll have a quick one myself. Um, in the, uh, we, we do show us uh, several examples also with uh, uh, quite limited, of course, number of, uh, of actions uh, and, and policies. But uh, in the real world, of course, the uh, complexity is much more higher. Uh, so th the question is, uh, is the same, uh, the same approach, let's say, let's say the same explanation and model can be applied uh, when the number of actions, uh, number of possible actions are actually uh, increasing or uh, possibly go into infinity. I mean, when you have, uh, like in real life, of course, you can uh, take 
uh, whatever action uh, you, you your mind <laughs> tests to you. Uh, so do, do you think how how things are more complex uh, in this case? Yeah. Again, that's, that's a great question. And it's something that entertains a lot of my colleagues and indeed myself, you know, the notion of how do you scale up to high dimensional action spaces and, and, and state spaces. Um, so there are a number of different approaches to this. The, the generic approach to scaling up usually rests some, upon some kind of amortization. Uh, so you borrow techniques from machine learning um, where you can, you can very quickly map from outputs to belief states, for example. You can learn to infer those things that can be inferred. But as you not as you point out, that's not really going to help you in deep tree searches over large um, repertoires of actions at each point in the in the in the tree. Um, so that's still to a certain extent um, um, an outstanding problem. Um, however, there are two things I think which mitigate, well, in fact, three things which mitigate against that um, that that um, challenge of scaling up to high dimensional action spaces and latent spaces. The first one is purely theoretical, and it comes back to the foundation of, um, or the interpretation of um, the thing that we are trying to optimize, namely the marginal likelihood or the model evidence. And remember that the model evidence is accuracy minus complexity. So if you can minimize the complexity, you're maximizing the evidence, which tells you immediately that the coarse graining of any given model of any time series data will have an optimal coarse graining, and it will be the simplest low dimensional manifold or the coarsest bins of a discrete state space that you can get away with to preserve a reasonable amount of accuracy. So there's always, if you like, a mathematical pressure to actually scale down, to actually get the simplest model with the smallest number of dimensions, the smallest number of plausible policies sufficient to explain your active sampling of, of these data. So that's something I think is often missed, especially in the drive to, you know, sort of big data and, and more and more complicated deep learning, deep RL models. Um, that's going in the wrong direction from the point of view of maximizing model evidence. You, you need to remove the redundant parameters and actually coarse grain a lot. The second thing which mitigates uh, that problem is that once you've formulated your uh, planning, your, your, your tree search for planning in, into the deep future, once you've formalized that in terms of this kind of belief updating, there are some very natural constraints on the depth of that tree search, very simple ones. For example, because you've now got uncertainty in the game, that means as you roll out in, into the future, deeper into the tree, the uncertainty starts to um, um, remove any useful information from going any further or any deeper into that tree. So there's a natural depth that, again, is mathematically prescribed just because you're now propagating beliefs into the future, as opposed to um, you know, just deciding, you know, if this, then, then that happens. If you actually propagate the uncertainty, you never have to do a deep tree search because there's no point because you're so uncertain about what's going to happen, there's no point thinking that far into the future. So there's always an optimum depth between uh, search, and that's usually, in my experience, much shorter than people uh, than people appreciate. The third point is a much more practical observation, and it speaks to you know, your question made me smile in the in the in the you know in the sense that the, there's an infinite number of actions we can take, and you're absolutely right, of course. You know, if I just take the simplest and probably really important action that I actually have to select nearly you know several times a second is where to look next. I mean, I could, in, in, in principle, in terms of R and theta, look at an infinite number of points in the next 250 milliseconds. And you know, that, that kind of active vision you know, uh, is, is vitally important for our, for our survival. Um, so how on earth does the brain do it? Well, it does it in parallel. So it has a, um, some, something called the superior colliculus, which is basically a map that if you stimulate, your eyes are drawn to that point in the map. And one way of looking at this salience map, this layer of cells is actually a two-dimensional representation of all possible actions. So the answer, very simply, the way that the biological systems scale up to large action spaces, not in time, you know, we're now just talking about one step ahead like policies, uh, where to look next, but in terms of the number 
is just to do it in parallel. So if you do it biomimetically or neuromorphically, uh, I don't think the scaling the scaling issue is is is, is insurmountable. Um, okay. Yeah. It, it, so do you think it's possible, uh, like as we think, uh, as we have in this model, this latent uh, uh, space, state space? Do you think it's possible to have similar concepts also in the action space of so some kind of latent uh, action uh, space or uh, some uh, let's say uh, action at a different level, higher level action? Yes. So, so. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a, again an exciting and, and uh, important observation. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and in fact that's that 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 simulated reading example actually had that so there were low level actions where there were little micro saccades around the word to look at different letters and then there were high level actions that jumped to the next word and um, so i'm sure in our real brains there are different levels where different levels can actually send predictions to our motor or our autonomic systems to elicit elicit actions and i think that you know that, that's that, that's absolutely true um but also i think that's an interesting question from the point of view of um control theory and um you know can you actually compose continuous movements in terms of a succession of of fixed points and you know it may be that that's how we work and uh, certainly talking to friends in neurorobotics, that 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 may be how to basically model or generate the predictions that drive the uh, the trajectories of motion. It's not a question of prescribing a complete path. You just have a series of fixed points which are basically become attractors for this discrete epoch of updating, and then you change to the next attractor. So you're you're pulling along. Um, you know, you're pulling in you know, in physical space, the, say a robotic arm, you're prescribing discrete fixed point attractors at discrete points in time um, that are pulling the trajectory around an orbit, um, say for walking or for, you know, sort of, uh, for reaching movements. So I think this notion of um, discretization of action is, is probably very important practically. Um, and, you know, and once you start to think about um, continuous dynamical trajectories and continuous state or space faces as um, a selection, as a sequence of um, fixed, stable or unstable points, there's some really interesting maths about sort of uh, heteroclinic cycles and Lie algebras uh, that live in a discrete state space that you can now deploy to start to characterize and generate continuous, continuous dynamics. So uh, yeah, I, I think that's yeah. And it, I don't know that there ha has been that much work in my field on it, but it, it, I think it's a really important um, opportunity to to try and put together the continuous with the with the discrete in the in the action domain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The, more questions from the audience. Okay. Probably not. I think we are. Time, I mean, it's uh yeah. 6 30 here, so uh, oh, let's thank again, uh, uh, Professor Frinstone, and yeah, best wishes to, to everybody. Thank you for attending. Thank you, Carl. Well, thank you. Happy Christmas, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye.